Okay, welcome back. This is part two of the discussion of uh, the Memorial Impulse, the last part of the last lecture for um, for Unit Four. And when we last left off, I was talking about um, some of the beautiful pieces like Serpent Mound, which is um, in Ohio, um, and other kind of beautiful mounds that were made by uh, the Native American groups that we call the Mound Builders, and it's interesting to think about whether they really plan these pieces on being permanent or not. Um, and they are not the only people in the world. There are lots of people all around the world who, who modified the earth as a way of making something that would last for a really long time. Um, and I, as I said, I think of Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial as being a similar impulse, although it functions in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think that it is important to think about it as a memorial. It is a memorial. Um, it's meant to be something permanent. And it's a different kind of memorial compared to, if we compare it to the bombastic approach towards militarism that we see in the Victory Steelery of Naram Sin or, or the tra Trajan's Column. And we compare that to Maya Lin's work, we see a very different uh, approach to, to war um, to focus on the loss, uh, to focus on, you know, literally the, the, the people that we lost, and to focus on it as, a, as an experience, as a journey, rather than as a thing. Uh, you experience uh, this work, but you have to walk through it. It makes sense because she studied architecture. And here are some other examples of monuments that I think are more about what we... Um, are better sides to ourselves. We've already seen a couple of Jenny Holzer's, um, and most of Jenny Holzer's work are meant to be very impermanent, but she did make a series of these marble s um, park benches. Um, and I think there's something beautiful about the idea of taking her work, which is so ephemeral and doesn't last forever, and then making at least a, a small group of them become something very, very permanent that will last hopefully for a very long time. Um, and I think of Cloud Gate also as a memorial piece that's about our aspirations rather than about triumphalism and other less positive things. And here is my last, last monumental work to talk about in that it is a memorial. It's a memorial for a single person. Um, and it is completely impermanent, although it becomes permanent because of the fact that it gets to be recreated over and over again. The way this work works, it's um, if you went to a museum and you saw a portrait of Ross installation, what you would see is something like this. You'd see a pile of candy. Some I've seen it where the pile of candy was in the center of a room, but um, sometimes it's a pile of candy organized in a corner of a room, like this photograph is here. And with the piece would always come a certain amount of signage, and the signage would explain to you that the piece is designed to work like a clock. Um, and the way it works is that you are supposed to go up to the piece and take a single piece of candy. And that it is based on the estimates of the number of visitors to this museum space, the number of people who come by, and how many people would take a piece of candy, that when this pile of candy runs out, that Ross will be dead. Um, because at the time that Felix Gonzalez Torres made the piece, Ross, um, his lover, was dying of AIDS. And so the the piece functions like a clock, um, but it only works as a clock uh, if we participate in it. So it makes us, in a in a weird way, kind of morally culpable um, to to Ross dying. And now the strange thing is that these this is then made again. Peop, you know, you can go to a museum now and see a museum do an installation, a portrait of Ross by Felix Gonzalez Torres, and but you know. Felix Gonzalez Torres is dead, and his lover is Ross is dead, um, so the clock no longer really counts down anything. But it is still um, an incredibly moving uh, memorial. So there you go. That's my last one. All right, that's the end of the lecture.